Okay, so one thing I want to talk to you about real quick. Um, you should, uh, while you've got Blackboard open, hopefully you've all got Blackboard open at this point, go to your announcements. Um, I sent an announcement this morning about listening assignment 1.2. Um, some of you had told me that the last link on listening assignment 1.2 for the young person's guide to the orchestra wasn't working, um, that it's showing that it wasn't found. So I sent another, a different link for you to use. Um, so if you were, if you, if you got an error on that last uh, piece for listing assignment 1.2, use that link that I uh, sent in the announcements as well. Also, um, it looks like, okay, and Hannah, um, you should be able to replace those with YouTube links. For 1.1, I sent out a replacement link. Uh, for one point, uh, for the second piece in 1.1, the CJM Blues, you can just search YouTube for CJM Blues by Duke Ellington, and you should be able to find the piece as well. Okay, um, and if you, if all else fails, if you, I'm sorry? Yeah, that it was the second piece in 1.1. It was the second half of it. Um, so if you, if you come across that, if it's a link that doesn't work for you, send me an email, um, and I can pretty easily send you an alternate link to use there. Um, okay, also, I want you all to check your school email, and I want you to look and see if you've gotten any emails from me um, yet. I've been sending my emails through um, Blackboard, the, the kind of group emails, and some of them are being caught by the spam filter in, uh, in our system. So you may want to check your spam folder, um, and if, there's, if it's showing up there that I sent something to the entire class, then you can release it and it should allow you to get it. I'm working on, hang on just a second, setting up groups um, within the email client so that I'm not going through Blackboard, but I have almost 200 students, so it's gonna take me a little while to get all those set up. Question? I think I have 20 a day, and I don't know why. Okay, so you're getting, can I see it? Yeah, so you're getting these proof point essential. Um, if you click on those proof point essentials and you hit approve, It'll pop up this thing, and then it'll stop sending you those okay. emails. Sure. Yeah. Um, okay. So Rebecca, right? Uh, Rebecca just uh, showed me on her phone that she's getting emails from uh, Proofpoint Essentials, um, and that basically is showing that that uh, that those emails through Blackboard are getting caught in the spam filter. Um, if you click on those emails, there's that, there's there's a little button down at the bottom that says Release and Approve. If you click on that, it'll stop sending you those emails and it'll go ahead and let the original email come through. And hopefully that will tell the spam filter that it's okay to get emails from this uh, server. But like I said, I'm working on uh, setting up a group email with all of my classes, all five sections of this class so that I can email you all at once. Um, it's just taking me a little while because I have to go in and manually put in every one of your email addresses. So that's uh, something that I wish that our uh, uh, system would go ahead and do for me, but you know, it is what it is, I guess. Okay, um, cool. Uh, any questions about assignments you've been working on so far or anything like that that's, that's just not working for you? That kind of stuff is more important to me in these uh, class sessions than getting through the lectures because the lectures are mostly stuff you can find. Yeah, let me throw on my uh, mask here and I'll Yes, if you click on that, and then down the under action, hit release and approve. And it should go ahead and send the, the email through to you. So that proof point essentials thing, what it's basically doing, it's a, it's a new filtering system that they put in place for us. And it's basically just saying, hey, we think this is spam. Um, check it out, see if it's spam. If it's not spam, go ahead and approve it uh, and it'll send it on through to you. And hopefully it's smart enough to learn that stuff coming from Blackboard is not spam. We'll see, I don't really know how it works. I'm not an IT person. Okay. If there are no further questions, then we'll go ahead and get started with today's stuff. So today we are going to get into uh, chapter two.
of part one, and we're going to go through um, some of this stuff. I'm going to speed through this pretty quickly. Um, I believe last week that I asked you to go ahead and do assignment 1.2 before class today, um, and that really that assignment has the meat of what we're going to be talking about. Um, those videos that are linked with that assignment kind of show this better than any way that I could describe it. Um, I just don't like, I'm not going to sit here in class and show a bunch of YouTube videos. Um, it takes up too much time and it's also kind of a waste of your time. You can watch YouTube videos at home. Okay. So, uh, make sure that you're doing that, uh, assignment 1.2 that you've done it. Um, and it'll give you more detail about the stuff that I'm going over today. Okay. So chapter two is all about the performing media, which means the way, uh, the things that we use to make music, okay? Whether it's our voices, uh, whether it's coming from people, or it's coming through an instrument of some kind. And this uh, chapter starts to tell us how we kind of organize uh, those voices and instruments uh, to be able to create the music. And that way, when we're talking about the, these pieces of music and I'm talking about instruments, you know what I'm talking about. Um, some of you, you know, have, if you were never in band or orchestra or anything, um, you may not know the difference between a flute and a clarinet. Um, and that's kind of what this is designed to do is to, to help show you the difference there and uh, help you to understand how these instruments work a little bit. Okay, so we're going to start off talking about voice. So music coming from a voice is unique in that it, it adds the ability to use words, to use lyrics, um, which can add a specific meaning. Now, there's a lot of instrumental music out there that does have a specific meaning. We're going to listen to some symphonies that have that tell stories through the music. Um, but when we can add a voice and we can start using specific lyrics or words, it makes it a lot easier to understand right? You, the music that you listen to most of the time is going to have lyrics, and that's probably what draws you to that, is that you, you can relate to that music in some way, okay? Most of you, the music that you listen to is in some way relatable to your life, or also music that you just happen to like the beat or the groove to, okay? That's normal as well. Um, so when we talk about voices, we're going to talk about different ranges of voices. Uh, different people have a different vocal range. And we talked about the pitch range uh, the other day on Thursday. And pitch range is just the, uh, the group of notes that you, can, that you can sing or you can play. And when we're talking about voices, we're talking about the group of notes that you can sing. And that vocal range is based on two factors. And this is an assignment question, by the way, if you want to have assignment 1.2 open. Um, it's based on two things, on physical makeup and on training. Okay, we naturally have a specific voice range. You really don't have any control over how your voice sounds, right? Um, you started talking when you were two years old, and it just kind of developed from there. And, of course, when you went through puberty, it changed. Um, but you, you really don't have a lot of control over it. Now, some people have gone through training to be able to control the way their voice sounds. If you want to do certain jobs, if you want to be a public speaker or something like that, you can kind of control that a little bit. But your natural voice is your natural voice. OK, and most of us are born with a specific range that we can sing in, whether you sing professionally or not, if you're singing in the shower, singing in the car, you have a certain range that you sing in, whether it's a high range or a low range uh, when you're singing along to the radio. And so that's one aspect of it. The other aspect is training. As you become a professional singer, as you start learning how to sing um, in choir when you're a child or uh, in high school, as you, as you go through that stuff, you develop that vocal range. You can develop and stretch your vocal range. That's why most professional singers have a much larger range than amateur singers. And that's also why a lot of classically trained singers have a much larger range than pop singers. Okay, because a lot of pop singers were not classically trained, especially on the rock and roll side. They're, they didn't go to music school. They didn't have all of that training. They just started, they picked up a guitar and started singing. And some of them have a great voice, uh, but they don't have that developed range. So the other day, for example, we talked about Brendan Urie, who's one of the greatest rock singers out there right now, and he has a five octave range. In contrast to that, 
If you're familiar with the group Pentatonix, uh, which is an a cappella vocal group that's been popular for about 10 years now, um, one of their singers, Mitch Grossi, has a six octave range. His, his range is actually larger than Brendan Urey's range, uh, but he's a classically trained singer. He was in choir in high school. I think he took some college classes um, in vocal training, and, and he's developed that range. Uh, my wife has a much larger range than I do because she was in choir in high school and took vocal lessons in college um, and is a professional singer. She gets paid to sing. Um, so she's got a much larger range than I do. All right, so you can develop that. Um, but we do naturally have a specific range that we're kind of tied to. And whenever uh, you look at vocal music, we divide the parts up based on those vocal ranges. We split it between males and females, and then we split those parts up. So the four basic parts that you find in vocal music are soprano, alto, tenor, and bass, or SATB. If you were to open up a church hymnal, you would see that those hymns have, they're written on a treble clef and a bass clef staff, and there's two parts per staff. The treble clef staff is the female staff, the top note is the soprano, the bottom note is the alto. On the bass clef staff, the top note is the tenor for men, and the bottom part is the bass part for men, the low part for men, okay? So the highest voice females typically fall into the soprano category. The females with lower voices fall under alto. The men with higher voices fall into tenor, and the men with lower voices fall into bass. And that's just kind of the basic way that we split up choir. If you were to join choir in seventh grade, that's how they would split you up. Now, a lot of times in seventh grade, um, most men have not, their voices haven't changed yet. So most boys in seventh grade choir are, could, are just put into one group. They don't split the men part, the boy parts yet uh, in that level of music. And they just call them baritones, which is kind of a halfway in between. Okay, but as you get into high school and professional, they do start to split up between bass voices and tenor voices. Okay, now that's not the only category that we have. We can actually divide it up uh, even more finely uh, based on ranges, and that's what this next little section shows you. So for females, you have soprano and alto is kind of the basic two. You're either a high voice or a low voice. But then we can also divide that out a little bit further, and we have contraltos, which means that you're a low alto, which means that you're an alto that can sing even lower down into the tenor and baritone range. Um, my wife uh, can actually sing. She's kind of both. Uh, she, she covers all of them because she has a huge range, but she can sing down into the low male range. In fact, she can sing lower than some of the tenors in my church choir. Um, so she could be considered a contra alto. Uh, sometimes uh, if you look at advanced choir music that's split into eight parts, you would have soprano one, soprano two, alto one, and alto two. Your alto twos are probably on the border there of being counter tenor, of being contra altos. Okay? Yes? Basically, I was a fifth of somebody else on my choir. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like I could be the one like sometimes listening to me. One part, like, yeah, so it just kind of depended on what you what he needed for that piece. My wife was kind of the same way. They just put her wherever, uh, wherever they need it. Um, we also have female voices that are kind of halfway between soprano and alto. Um, they don't quite sing high enough to be a soprano. They don't quite sing low enough to be considered a full alto. They fall in the middle there, and that's what we call mezzo-sopranos. Okay, or soprano twos. All right, and that's actually pretty common. Most untrained women are mezzo sopranos. That's kind of where your range is. There's like an octave and a half to two octave range uh, that's that mezzo soprano range. For men, we typically have tenor and bass. Tenor is the high, bass is the low, but again, we have some kind of other uh, for specific cases when we get into professional musician. We have the baritones which are sort of like the mezzo-sopranos, but on the men's side, their voices aren't low enough to be considered basses and aren't really high enough to be a full-on tenor, so we call them a baritone. Uh, most of your rock and roll singers from the 90s, uh, from like the grunge era, if you think about like Eddie Vedder uh, or Kurt Cobain, um, those singers are mostly baritones. They've got that kind of rich baritone sound. 
right? And then you also have what are called counter tenors, which are men with very high voices. They can sing well above the standard tenor range. And we consider those to be counter tenors. Uh, Mitch Grossi from Pentatonix is a counter tenor. I would probably consider somebody like Bruno Mars a counter tenor. That dude sings super high all the time. He sings in the falsetto range all the time. Um, and so these are, uh, if they're young, we tend to call them boy sopranos. Um, they're boys that can sing soprano parts just as, just as well. But then as they get older, they become known as a counter tenor, as a male that can sing way up into the soprano range, right? Um, as it says in the book here, typically vocal music is accompanied by uh, some kind of instrument. Um, part of that is to kind of help stabilize. If you have vocalists singing a cappella, uh, which means without an instrument, with them, then they tend to drift pitch-wise. Um, they most often go a little bit flat. Uh, so having a piano with you helps to kind of keep that up to pitch. Now, more advanced groups can sing a cappella and can sing it very well. Some of my favorite choir music is a cappella choir music. And one of the reasons for that, I do want to kind of pause and talk about this, and I, I I could go on forever about the physics of sound and, and intonation and stuff like that. I've studied this kind of stuff a lot. Um, but instruments, the piano, for example, is an imperfect instrument. It uses what's called a um, equal temperament tuning system, which basically means we started with A440 and we used a mathematical equation to divide up all of the other notes. Okay, they're not exactly the frequencies that occur in nature. All right, if you take any kind of tube and you blow through that tube, especially if you put a brass mouthpiece on it, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, you get what's called the harmonic series. And that's basically all of the notes that naturally resonate within that tube. And if you divide it out, those are all the notes that are perfectly in tune within that key, which is why early instruments, um, only would play in one key because they were tuned perfectly for that key. But after a while, we decided we wanted keyboard instruments that could play in all of the different keys, and we wanted some other instruments, wind instruments, that could do that. So we started just sort of mathematically dividing it, and we created an imperfect system. And what that means is that the piano is never fully in tune with itself. Okay, If you play a chord on a piano, it's pretty close if it's tuned well, but it's still not perfect because the, the harmonics are not lining up exactly the way that they want to. With voices, if you have uh, your voices, your singers sing a major chord, we naturally adjust those pitches to perfectly line up in tune. So we're actually lowering and raising the pitches just a little bit to make the harmonies that we want. And that's why a cappella voices can sound so magical when you hear them together. There's a pentatonics tune that my daughter has really gotten into pentatonics lately. Um, and there, we listened to one of their tunes in the car the other day called Run to You. Um, and I don't know if it's an original or an arrangement. I don't know the original song. Um, but that piece of music is absolutely beautiful. I suggest that you go check it out. Um, the way that the harmonies line up and the way that the voices blend and tune to each other, um, it's, it's magical. I mean, you get this beautiful, beautiful sound from the acapella voices. And it wouldn't sound nearly as good if they had a piano playing with them because they would have to um, use that uh, piano to tune their pitches. Okay, Jonathan, remind me at the end of class, and I'll uh, I'll get you counted here as present. Okay, so now let's talk about instruments. Voices are pretty easy, right? Because it's just people, <laughs> and we just divide them into the the range there. With instruments, we open a whole can of worms because there's all kinds of instruments out there, and the way that we define a musical instrument is as any me uh, mechanical um, any mechanism other than a voice that produces musical sounds, okay? And these can be obvious or not so obvious. We have all of the obvious stuff, which is what we're gonna talk about uh, and divide into categories, you know, the flute, the violin, the, you know, trumpets and things like that. Um, but then you have sometimes stuff that's a little bit less obvious. Uh, the band, uh, if you're familiar with the group Stomp, that's kind of become a Broadway spectacle these days. Um, they got really popular in the late 90s. Um, they use things like trash cans and brake drums and anvils and all kinds of stuff to create 
their musical sounds. Um, the Blue Man Group does kind of the same thing. They use a lot of PVC pipe and things like that to create their musical sounds. Um, or we can have the obvious instruments like the piano, the flute, the violin, the trumpet, things like that. Our Western instruments, and now this is a good time for me to kind of pause and talk about Western music. Um, this class studies primarily Western music which means music that developed uh, or originated in Europe or uh, North America. Okay, we tend to focus on that because the music that you listen to is primarily linked uh, to that music. Those are the origins there. Okay, now when we, when we talk about rock and we talk about hip hop a little bit, uh, we'll get into some of the other non west there. Um, and also the last chapter, the last unit, Okay, we're back. Sorry about that, guys. Um, our internet's been kind of blotchy this week. I think the storms earlier this week had a hard time with it. I am recording this, so you'll be able to go back and watch it later. And if you're following along with the PowerPoint presentation, then, then you should be okay. Okay, so Western instruments we have. Uh, we have six broad categories of instruments that we look at. And those six broad categories are the string instruments, the woodwind instruments, the brass instruments, percussion, keyboard instruments, and electronic instruments. So we've got those six broad categories. I also think that we can divide electronic instruments up into analog and digital instruments because there is a difference um, there. And that digital side will include things like computers and samplers and all of the stuff that's used to make popular music today. But we don't have to worry too much about that. These instruments are made in varying sizes to, uh, a, a, to have that variety in range. We talked about when we talked about frequency, generally larger objects vibrate slower, so they have a lower pitch. So if we want to have a woodwind instrument that we want lower pitched, we're going to have to make it a larger instrument. It's going to have to be a longer tube for the air to go through. Okay. The popularity of different instruments tends to kind of rise and fall uh, based on what's popular at the time. You know, we are in a time period now where um, electronic uh, instruments are very popular. Synthesizers, drum machines, samplers are used all the time in pop music. Uh, if you listen to rock music or country music, um, guitars, drums, basses, those kind of things are very popular. You know, a hundred years ago, uh, jazz music was much more popular. Um, so things like the saxophone and uh, the trumpets and those were, were used a lot more commonly than anything else. Yes. Will we talk about what? Country. Not really. Um, we'll we'll kind of talk about the development of pop music, but we don't um, we don't specifically get into every subgenre of pop music. Okay. Um, all right, so most common in the classical side of things, we have orchestras and symphonic bands. All right, and the, the difference between those, a symphonic band or a wind ensemble doesn't have strings. So your high school and college bands, if it says wind ensemble or symphonic band, that means it's not gonna have the strings that the orchestra has. And that's a lot more common in high schools and colleges. Um, in the early 20th century, the marching band became popular um, with things like the John Philip Sousa band. Um, so we started to see those more commonly used in schools than in orchestras. And especially in the South, um, we tend to have a very football centric mindset when it comes to music. Um, so we think of marching band as being more important because that's what's used for the football games. Um, so in the in the fall, you have your band programs focusing on the marching band side, and then in the spring, they do the more classical side of things, but they still don't have the string instruments. You know, you're not going to march a cello around a football field, um, so they don't do that. There are a few schools that have orchestra programs still. I think in Arkansas, I think we have 10 high schools that have orchestras still, um, 
and they are becoming more popular. There's a lot more people that are that are doing that. But um, Conway has one. Uh, Little Rock has one. Um, or Parkview High School, at least in Little Rock, has an orchestra program. Um, but they're uh, they are becoming more popular. Okay. So now we're going to talk specifically about these different categories of music, starting with the strings. In an orchestra, the strings are the central part. The earliest orchestras were just string orchestras. Okay, and these are the violin, the viola, the cello, and the bass as the main bowed orchestral instruments. Um, the way that a string instrument works is very simple. You take some kind of string, either a metal cord. Uh, early ones were made out of gut where they would literally take intestines from animals and they would stretch them out into these cords. Um, and you would put it over uh, some kind of resonating chamber. Um, if you think about the body of a violin or a guitar, uh, and they would pluck those strings or bow those strings to vibrate them and resonate the sound. And that's how these early string instruments were. They developed and developed and developed. And by the time we get into the 15th century, we have our modern violin. All right. Um, the violin is the smallest of the string instruments. And because it's the smallest, it has the highest pitch. The strings are short and wound very tight. So they're going to produce the highest pitches. And I think most of us have a pretty good idea of what a violin looks like and probably sounds like. If not, when you do assignment 1.2, you'll see it. They'll show it to you in action. The viola can be a little bit confusing. If I were to walk in here with a viola and just a viola and say, what is this instrument? You would probably call it a violin. It has the same basic shape as a violin. It's played the same way, tucked under the chin and played this way with a bow but it's a larger instrument. It's a little bit bigger than the violin. If you hold two of them up together, you can see that the viola is a little bit longer and the body's a little bit bigger, okay? It also has an, a lower sound. The strings are tuned a little bit lower. The violin is tuned from lowest to highest, G, D, A, E. So the lowest string is the G, and then it goes from there to D to A to E. The viola, has the G, D, and A strings, but then it has one lower string, which is a C. Okay, so it can play a fifth lower. It also, because it's a little bit larger and the strings aren't quite wound as tight, it tends to have a more mid-rangey, nasally sound to it. Okay, um, I personally love the viola. I use it as a solo instrument in a lot of my music uh, because it, I think it has a really unique characteristic, uh, a really unique tone color as we had talked about the other day. The cello is literally twice the size of the viola. It is exactly double the viola. The strings are the same tuning, CGA, but twice as long. They're an octave down, okay? Now, of course, because the cello is so big, you can't duck it under your chin and play it like a violin. You have to hold it in front of you and play it uh, out front. And most of the time, your cellists are going to be seated whenever they play. They'll sit on a chair or on a stool and have the violin re or the cello resting on the floor with a, a, a peg at the bottom of it, and they'll play that way. Okay? Similar to that is the upright bass or the double bass or the acoustic bass, as you sometimes hear it called. This is a much larger string instrument, still has the same basic shape, but basses tend to be about six feet tall from the bottom to the top of the neck. Um, those are our lowest voice instruments. They're tuned in fourths instead of fifths, so it's E, A, D, G. Um, and these, again, are played standing up. All right, so you stand up or sit on a large stool to play the bass. So if you're watching a video and you see what looks like a cello, but the guy is standing up and the instrument is six feet tall, you're actually looking at a bass. Okay, I tend to have students get those confused a lot uh, whenever they see them. And a good thing to look for is, number one, if they're standing up and playing it, it's probably a bass. But if you look at the bottom of it, if the bottom of the, if they're standing up and playing and the bottom of the instrument is almost on the floor, there's just a few inches of peg down at the bottom, it's definitely a bass, okay? If you're playing a cello standing up, you're going to have a long, like, two or three foot peg 
coming off of the bottom of the from the between the body and the floor. All right, so that's a good thing to look for there. Most of the time, those string instruments are played by pulling a bow across the string. Now, you're not going to have to know all of these terms that are on the board. So those of you that are taking notes, don't write all of them down. Um, you're not going to need to know all of them. But um, most of the time, you have a bow, which is a piece of wood with uh, horse hair or some kind of synthetic hair drawn across it and tightened up, and a rosin, which makes it sticky. And then you pull it across the strings, and it makes it vibrate. And that creates the string sound that we're used to. There are some other techniques. Uh, the top one there is, I believe, a, a test question, um, and that is pizzicato. Pizzicato means that you're plucking the string. Okay, you can pluck a violin string or a cello string like you would a guitar or a banjo. Okay, it's, it doesn't sustain as long as it does on a guitar. It's a very short plucked sound when you hear it. Um, it's very easy to identify it when you listen to it. It gives it that very plucky sound. Um, but that's a pretty common technique that we have there. And I don't want to get too much into these other ones just for the sake of time. Okay. We do have some, some string instruments that are, that don't use a bow. Typically they are plucked with either the finger fingers or with what is called a plectrum. And those are instruments like the guitar and the harp, uh, the mandolin, the banjo, when we get into the folk instruments and they use, uh, either their fingers or a plectrum. All right. Those of you that are online, you might be able to see me if I hold it up here. This is a plectrum. In America, we call them picks. All right. It's a guitar pick. It's easy as that. All right. Uh, English people tend to call them plectrums still, uh, and that's kind of the classical term for it. There's many different varieties. This is kind of the most common for rock and folk music, folk guitarists. Um, banjo players have picks that actually slide onto their fingers so that they can still play finger style, but it amplifies the sound a little bit. It makes it louder. Um, harps have the same thing. They're just basically little pieces of metal that they put on there and it makes it a little bit louder. Um, so there's a, there's a wide variety there of plectrums. Most of them are made out of plastic or nylon. Some are made of metal. Uh, some are even made of wood and other things. I actually have a, a pick at home that's a handcrafted uh, wooden pick that I think is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, like I can't imagine like the winner of the that's really cool. Yeah, you can definitely use them as collectibles. A lot of times uh, at concerts, you know, the guitarist will throw out their picks and you can have them. And I, I think that's really neat um, to have stuff that's customized or signed. Um, that, that is a cool thing to do. I know some people, um, one of my, my best friend in high school was a, was a girl. Um, and she liked to take my old picks and, and hole punch them and put them on a necklace and wear them. Um, she would also take my old bass strings and uh, wind them together and create bracelets out of them. Um, so I thought that was that was a pretty cool thing to do. Yeah. Oddly enough, she married a guy who's almost exactly like me. <laughs> Weird. But she lives in Abilene, Texas now, and it's hot there. So I'm not going. She actually she got married in Abilene, Texas on a farm uh, on like the first week of July. If you can imagine. It was like 112 degrees. I was a uh, I was a bridesman, uh, which basically meant I was in the wedding, but I didn't know the groom that well, so I was on the bride's side. I, I was with all the girls, um, and it was I was wearing a suit, and it was ridiculous. And my my wife at the time, who's my now my first wife, my ex wife, uh, was pregnant at the time, so she was you know this big in 104 degree heat in on a farm in Abilene. It was not a good time. I still give her crap about that. That was a long time ago. I guess that was almost that was like 11 years ago now. Anyway, back on the farm. I mentioned earlier this year that I, I ramble. I, I get distracted easily. That was one of those examples. Um, okay, so the next category of instruments I want to look at are the woodwind instruments. Um, the woodwind instruments traditionally were made out of wood. They were instruments that were carved out of wood. Um, and these were early recorders and flutes. Uh, that people figured out if you hollowed out a piece of wood, you could blow over the top of it. And if you cut holes in it, you could actually create different notes, 
all right? Those developed and developed and developed throughout the centuries. And these days, they're not all made out of wood, okay? Flutes are no longer made out of wood at all. Flutes that you see in an orchestra are going to be made out of metal, um, some kind of, of metal alloy, um, sometimes plated with different things. You have silver plated, gold plated um, that, that give you a slightly different uh, sound. Um, saxophones, of course, are made out of brass. Um, clarinets, if you play clarinet uh, as a beginner in sixth grade band, um, it, you probably played a, cl a plastic clarinet um, because that keeps them a little bit cheaper and they're a little bit more durable. Professional clarinets are still made out of wood and then they have the metal keys and other things on them. But early clarinets, uh, you know, younger uh, non-professional clarinets, beginner clarinets are typically made out of plastic. Um, most of the other woodwind instruments are still made out of wood, the bassoons, the oboes, English horns, things like that. Um, so we have a bunch of different uh, woodwind instruments that we see in the orchestra that have different ranges. And they're listed here basically in order of the ranges. I think the oboe and the clarinet's actually switched. Um, but the, the flute family are the highest pitch voices. Those would be the soprano voices in the orchestra. We have both the piccolo and the flute. The piccolo is effectively a half size flute. It's very small, has a very, very high pitch. And that is the highest pitch woodwind instrument in the orchestra. Okay, yeah. The what is? Oh. Oh, I, I didn't know that. Um, so you've got the piccolo, which is the highest woodwind instrument. I'm pretty sure that's a test question. Um, and then you have the flutes in that family as well. These are uh, played out to the side, and uh, they're blown over the. You blow over a hole on the top of it to create the pitch. We're going to look at that in detail in a second. Um, the next instrument as far as range is actually the oboe family. Um, and you have the oboe and the English horn. The English horn is just a slightly larger version of the oboe that plays in more of the mid range, kind of the alto range down into the tenor range. We have the clarinet, which actually has the largest range of the woodwind family because of the design, the physical properties of it. It has a very large range. Um, it play very low and very high. And we have both the clarinet and the bass clarinet, and there are many different varieties of bass clarinets. We have alto clarinets that are kind of halfway between, and then we get all the way up into contrabass clarinets, which are very large clarinets that have a very deep range. And then we also have, hang on a second, the bassoon family, um, which is a larger kind of tenor bass range, double reed instrument. Uh, and then the contra bassoon is a very large version of the bassoon that plays down in the lowest register. So the contra bassoon is the lowest pitch of the woodwind instruments that you're going to find in an orchestra. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so woodwinds are single note instruments, which means that they are designed to play one note at a time. There are some special techniques to be able to make multiphonics come out, but those are uh, extended range techniques that we're not, we're not going to worry about. All right. So a woodwind instrument is uh, the sound is created from the player's breath. They blow out in some way. And you have several different styles of mouthpiece in the woodwind instruments. They, it kind of varies. The early woodwind instruments were recorders, which used a, um, with, uh, we'll, we'll talk about saxes in just a second, Jonathan. Um, the uh, whistle mouthpiece, which looks just like a whistle, like a referee's whistle, um, and it basically functions the same way. We just attach that to a tube to create, to, to stabilize the pitch and to create um, musical sounds with it. Um, flutes in an orchestra use the, um, a mouth hole design where you blow over the top of it, just like you would a Coke bottle or something like that. Okay, and then we have our reed instruments uh, that are woodwind instruments that we have designed these reeds to attach to, which is a thin piece of cane. Uh, as you can see here, this is a clarinet mouthpiece that has this thin piece of wood that you attach to it. You put it in your mouth and you blow on it and it vibrates that piece of wood, which then resonates through the instrument to create the sound. You can actually take just a clarinet mouthpiece with a reed on it and blow into it. It's a really harsh, high-pitched sound, but you can hear what's actually happening there. 
And then when we attach it to a longer tube, it stabilizes it again, and we're able to create lower pitches. Okay? Yes? Do what? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. You have to speak up. Cool. That's awesome. It's a very popular instrument. Um, and I'm going to talk about it in just a second. So our single reed instruments, instruments that use just a single reed, are the clarinet and the saxophone, which means that you have a mouthpiece and one piece of cane attached to them. And then we have our double reed instruments, which are the oboe, the English horn, the bassoon, and the contrabassoon. And those actually have, you can see at the bottom of the slide, it's two pieces of cane that are wrapped together, and you blow on that, and they vibrate together to create the sound. And as you might expect, it's a very nasally sound. Uh, and then you attach it to the instrument, and it, it stabilizes it, and you get the tones that you want. Um, if you've ever used a turkey call, uh, turkey calls and, and duck calls typically use a reed of some kind to create the sound. Um, the bagpipes actually use a double reed inside the tube that you blow into to create the sound as well. Okay, now the saxophone, a couple of you have mentioned the saxophone. So the saxophone is a single reed woodwind instrument. It is not commonly found in the orchestra. The reason for that is because the saxophone wasn't invented until 1850. Most of the classical music that we play in orchestras was, were written before the saxophone even existed. And because of that, even modern classical music very rarely includes the saxophone because most standard orchestras don't employ a saxophonist. If they have to have a saxophone for something, they pull in somebody else or they have one of their clarinet players play the saxophone. There are some composers that will include saxophone in their classical music. Um, there's some great pieces by uh, Maurice Ravel, um, arrangements especially that he did that have some great saxophone solos in them. But you really don't see them in orchestras very often. Um, it's typically just not one of the woodwind instruments that's used there. It's more common in jazz and symphonic bands and wind ensembles, uh, but not used very often in the orchestra. They are made of brass, but they're considered woodwind instruments uh, because they use that reed design that the clarinet uses. Um, the basic idea behind the saxophone when it was invented was that Adolf Sax wanted an instrument that would fall between the woodwinds and the brass. And I think he succeeded. It's the timbre of the saxophone really fits between those. It's loud like a brass instrument, but it can have the softer characteristics of a woodwind instrument as well. Um, unlike the woodwind instruments, the brass instruments all use the same type of mouthpiece. Okay, the orchestral brass instruments in uh, order of range. Um, Jonathan, the contra saxophones and contra bass saxophones, they're just not as common. They're very expensive um, and they're, they're kind of ungainly. They're, they're huge instruments and they're, you know, most of the time they can be, the contra basses especially can be eight to 10 feet tall um, and they're just difficult to deal with um, and uh, they're very expensive. There's, there's really only a small number of those that exist in the world. Um, even the bass saxophone is not as common. Um, you don't usually see high schools with bass saxophones. They usually have a baritone saxophone. Um, the bass saxophones are usually relegated to uh, colleges. Uh, UCA has one bass saxophone that they use in their ensembles. Um, they, they're, just, they're just not as common, partially because they're, um, the sound's a little bit funky. They're hard to play. They're hard to control, um, and they're very expensive instruments. Um, okay, so the brass instruments in order of range are the trumpet, the French horn, the trombone, and the tuba. Those are the ones that are used commonly in orchestras. Okay, they started out, or early orchestras in the Baroque and classical era had trumpets and a couple of French horns, and then trombones and tubas were added later. Yes. Uh, there's the English horn is woodwind. The French horn is a brass. Yeah, that's the difference there. Um, the cornet, which is kind of like a trumpet, it's just a smaller, more rounded version of the trumpet. There's some other specifications that I'm not going to get into, um, is used in band along with the baritone horn and the euphonium. 
uh, those get added in when you're looking at band brass instruments, just different varieties of these brass instruments. Now, all of the brass instruments have a mouthpiece that's shaped like this. I'll hold it up to the camera so that you can see me if you're online. All right, you can also see them on the slide there, and I've got one that I'm holding up in class. This is a trumpet mouthpiece. And the sound is produced the same way for all of the brass instruments. You put the mouthpiece up to your lips and you vibrate your lips together to create the sound like this. Okay, so you can control the pitch with your lips by adjusting the speed uh, and the tightness of your lips. Um, but the mouthpiece helps really control it. You can actually buzz into any tube um, but the shape of the mouthpiece of a brass mouthpiece helps to control it and it makes it a lot easier. Okay, the sound exits through uh, the end of the instrument, which is called the bell. Um, if you're in class, you can, I've got a plastic uh, trumpet here called a P trumpet. Um, the, the sound comes out of this end, which is a bell. I'll hold it up here so you guys can see it. This end is the bell. Um, and uh, as it says here, we can change the pitch in two different ways. The pressure of the lips uh, that, that we apply in the, the speed of the air can change the pitch, or we can also change the length of the instrument. Okay, so if I was to put this mouthpiece onto this plastic trumpet and play it, it sounds like this. It's been a long time since I played trumpet. And I can, without pushing any valves down, get some different notes out. Okay, now I haven't played trumpet in a long time, and I'm not a trumpet player to begin with, so it's not the best tone in the world, but you get the idea. Okay, that's how uh, the trumpet works. Now, if I push down a valve, all I'm doing is lengthening the instrument. Each valve lengthens the instrument by a different amount. If I push down the middle valve, it opens up this tiny little piece of tubing in the middle, which lowers the pitch by a half step. So all I did was push down the valve. If I push the first valve down, it opens up a length of tubing twice as long, and it's uh, a whole step down. And if I push down the third valve, it's three times as long, as the original, as the smallest valve, and it lowers the pitch by a step and a half. And with those different combinations, I can get the full chromatic range of notes. Okay, if I start on one and I use what's called the descending valve pattern, I go through all of the different pitches. So I go through all the different notes by using a different combinations of valves. Okay, most brass instruments have that kind of system. The trombone is different. The trombone has one long slide on it instead of valves. Uh, so it's the, the pitch is changed by extending that valve out. And the trombone is the instrument that I played in high school and college. I do have a plastic one over here, but I don't want to dig it out just yet. Um, and uh, that was my main instrument for a long time. These days, I mostly play guitar, bass, and drums. Um, but uh, so the trombone uses sliding tube to create the different sounds. And, and trombonists have to use their ears and muscle memory to figure out exactly where the, the notes are supposed to go. OK? Generally, the way it works is the longer the tube, the lower the pitch. Now, we can also, uh, as I mentioned, uh, and as I demonstrated, we can get different notes by changing our pitch pressure. Ah, I used to be able to play pedal tones, I can't anymore. Um, but you get the idea there, all right? And that's using what's called the harmonic series uh, or the overtone series to create all of those different sounds. Um, Mouthpieces come in a variety of size based on the instrument. The tuba mouthpiece is the biggest. It goes almost entirely over your lips, um, whereas the trumpet and the French horn mouthpieces are very small and only cover a small portion of your lips. Okay, percussion instruments. Generally, 
produce sounds by striking, shaking, or rubbing the instrument. If you strike it, you shake it, or you rub it, it's a percussion instrument. Now there's an infinite variety of percussion instruments and percussion players oftentimes get stuck with weird instruments as well. So if the, if the piece calls for a rain whistle, it's usually the percussionists that are gonna do it. Um, sometimes they even use uh, these tubes that they wave over their heads to create this whistling sound. Um, it sounds like wind blowing. Um, so they, there's all kinds of weird random stuff that the percussionists have to use. But generally in the orchestra, you see timpani, uh, snare drums, bass drums, and then the different keyboard instruments, the pitched percussion instruments. So we divide percussion instruments into definite pitch and indefinite pitch, or pitched and unpitched, as we call them sometimes. So the definite pitch instruments are the timpani, which are the only percussion drums that have a definite pitch. Timpani are actually very large drums, uh, sometimes called kettle drums because it looks like a large kettle. Um, they're generally made out of copper uh, and they have a large drum head stretched over them and you can uh, tune them based on uh, a pedal and it changes the pitch. So we actually tune those to notes. So you'll hear timpani do things like boom, 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 boom in the orchestra where they're actually tuned to different pitches. So they're the only drums that have a definite pitch. That's a test question, by the way. The other pitched instruments in the percussion family are keyboard instruments. The glockenspiel, the xylophone, the celeste, and the chimes. The glockenspiel, the xylophone, and the marimba, which they didn't include here, um, are the instruments you would probably just call it a xylophone if you looked at it. Um, if you played ORF instruments in middle school, these are that's basically what these are. Um, they're large, they're bars that are tuned and they're laid over resonators and you strike them with a stick to get a different sound. The celeste is sort of a keyboard instrument. Um, if you know, if you're familiar with um, the Harry Potter soundtrack, which we're actually going to listen to late in the semester, but the um, blah, 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 no, not that, nope, 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 nope. The uh, what's Hedwig's theme? Um, I just lost it now. Anyway. That use the the main Harry Potter theme that you hear bum bum ba dum bum 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 is first played on a celeste. It has that very kind of dreamlike keyboard sound. And then chimes are large metal tubes that you strike the top of to get the different pitches out of them. Right, wind chimes are the same basic idea. Yeah. And then we also have some indefinite pitch instruments that are noise-like, um, things like the snare drum. Uh, the bass drum, the tambourine, the triangle, cymbals, gongs, sometimes called a tam-tam, all kinds of stuff, okay? Um, and then what, what's actually vibrating to create the sound are either membranes, which is what you see on a drum, your drum heads, those are actually membranes uh, or called membranes, and drums are, are sometimes called membranophones, um, or pieces of wood or metal, the cymbals or the wood blocks or things like that, or... Um, other types of uh, sometimes plastic things like that and that is what's vibrating to create the sound. Typically percussion is used to emphasize rhythm especially the indefinite pitch that's what they're there for okay the pitch percussion instruments do sometimes give us some melodic ideas as well. Okay so in the orchestra we typically have strings, woodwinds, brass, and percussion. Those are the four that we see in the orchestra. Now we kind of skipped over keyboard instruments. Um, those are like the piano and the organ and the harpsichord, which we'll talk about in the Baroque era. Um, you pretty much have a good idea of what the keyboard instruments are. They use an actual keyboard uh, to play them. And that, that's not necessarily what we're talking about. When we talk about electronic keyboards, that's kind of a separate category of instruments. All right, so I do want to talk today a little bit about electronic instruments and um, the way they're used. So your daily listening today was an electronic instrument, was a synthesizer. Um, so electronic instruments produce their sound through electricity by using electronics. We run electricity through resistors and diodes and oscillators to create these different kinds of sounds. Um, these were originally invented in 1904, um, though they were very rare. Uh, early on, it wasn't until about 1950 that we started to see synthesizers develop 
uh, for musical purposes. And these early synthesizers were very large. If you think about computers from the 1950s, these big room-sized computers, that's what early synthesizers look like as well. And some of them had a computer interface where you would actually, you could input uh, a bunch of information into it and it would play back that information. And a lot of early electronic music, that was what they were doing. They were specifying, okay, I want this frequency at this duration um, and I want you to use this style of sound wave to create the sound. Uh, and they would actually put it in like computer code and it would spit back out the music. That's why a lot of early electronic music sounds really, really weird to us. Sounds like alien music to us. Um, with modern electronic instruments, we really kind of blur the lines there between, um, you know, using computers and hybrid devices, uh, electronic instruments with acoustic properties, um, and we really kind of, we, we can do whatever we want now with modern technology. Um, it's pretty interesting. Um, the tape studio was used very often in the 1950s, and this was where the sound actually was coming from magnetic tapes, like a cassette or a VHS tape. Um, you had instruments that actually had these tapes inside them, where when you played the note, it was actually playing back a sound on the tape. Okay, it's like an early, like an early sampler. Today, those are all digital. So you load it all into your sampler and you hit the button and it plays the sound you want. Early on, those were actually sound recorded onto a tape that it would play back. Um, synthesizers became used in uh, the 1960s. And um, the definition of synthesizers is uh, in the textbook and is one of the uh, uh, exam questions there. You can look that up later on. So original synthesizers were these huge machines that I talked about earlier that took up an entire room or wall. Um, and then in the 1980s, um, we started to see digital synthesizers and FM synthesizers become popular. And that's when we started to see these smaller synthesizers that we could take home. Um, those were really popular in the 1980s, especially in pop music. Um, and those are like what you think of as an early keyboard instrument. Those were actually digital or FM synthesizers. Um, and then eventually we start to add effects uh, in integrating them in, and then sampling technology in the 1990s became huge um, with the, the original Akai MPC um, and drum machines and stuff like that, all developed out of the synthesizer technology. Um, there is a technology known as MIDI, which was developed in 1983, which is the Musical Instrument Digital Interface. And the idea there was we wanted to be able to connect our electronic instruments together. We wanted a way to be able to play one keyboard and have the sound come out of a different keyboard or to have our sampler running at a specific tempo and have another sampler locked into that same tempo in what we call a clock. So we developed this interface called MIDI and the original MIDI interface is a five pin interface. You might be able to barely see it. This has the original MIDI ins and outs over here. It almost looks like a microphone cable, but it has five pins and it was able to send information like the pitch value. Of course, that's what we mostly need. The frequency that we're doing, um, the uh, length of time that we want to hold it, the kind of attack and release we want to use. Um, all kinds of information could be sent over MIDI cables. Um, modern day MIDI is most often transmitted over USB. You get a much higher bandwidth. We can send a lot more MIDI information and it's much more common and cheap for us to be able to hook up MIDI stuff. Um, if you see these, those, uh, electronic musicians using the square launch pads, which became popular a few years ago, um, those are MIDI instruments. You tap on that, uh, one of those squares, one of those glowing squares, and it creates a sound. It plays back a sound for you. Okay, modern composers use um, these MIDI ends in combination with computers and all kinds of stuff to create all kinds of new types of music. That's something that I'm very big on. Um, if you've explored my YouTube channel at all, um, you've probably seen that. I use my iPad as my main composition tool these days. Um, and I create, I have a whole bunch of different synthesizers built into my iPad and I can create an entire piece of music entirely on my iPad. Um, and the technology there is, has really come a long way. Um, if you have an iPad or you have a Mac, uh, MacBook, you have a program called GarageBand, which is free. 
Um, and that's a program that not only allows you to record instruments and voices, but also has a huge library of built-in MIDI sounds where you can create drum loops and create all kinds of melodies and things like that. Explore that. Have a little fun with it. You'd be amazed what you can do. My uh, eight-year-old nephew has a, a, an iPod Touch because they didn't want to get him a cell phone yet, but he's got GarageBand on it, and he started kind of creating his own beats and sounds with it and started exploring that. And I encourage you to do that. It's a lot of fun. That's what got me into composition uh, in the late 90s using uh, Cakewalk and FL Studio on my old computers. Okay. Um, next uh, on, uh, what's today, Thursday? On Tuesday, we will get into uh, chapter three, and we'll actually, chapters three through ten will go much faster than the first two chapters did. Um, so we'll get through those uh, on Tuesday, and then remember that your first exam will be next Thursday. Uh, do remember that your uh, all of your assignments for part one are due um, about a week from today, a week from tomorrow, actually, on September 11th. So if you have not started working through those, and many of you have not, I suggest that you get to it because they don't take you all that much time to do each individual one, but if you have to do them all at once, it's going to take you a few hours to get through them. All right, so make sure you're getting those done. If you have any questions, um, I'll stick around, or uh, you can put something in the chat, and I'll try to answer you in the next few minutes. Of course, you can always email me if you need anything. Otherwise, have a great day. Yes, Mary, that's correct. The, the, it is just one instrument that's creating uh, those sounds, the, mo the modul Urenberg modular synthesizer. That's correct.